I praise the Lord. My dad is with Jesus. Amen. I'm certain if I told him that today I would preach his funeral, he'd probably tell me, don't do that, son. Why don't you preach a revival? I'm sure if I told him I was coming to glorify his life, he would say, don't do that. Why don't you glorify the Lord? I'm very thankful for my father. 70 plus years here, now he's with the Lord. He, he beat us home. He beat us home. You know, if there's anything I've heard my dad say more than once, if there's anything I've heard my dad say a hundred times, it's everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> he said it so often, it's become part of my lingo, whether I like it or not. <laughs> I'm very thankful for being raised in a Christian household. Uh, forgive me, my heart is broken, my emotions are a mess. But by God's grace, His Spirit is strong. Tracy Douglas Fannin, he, he gave me his middle name. He was saved after having my brother. My dad had a rough start in life. He was not raised in a Christian household, in fact, quite the opposite. He was raised in West Virginia. His parents, it was a broken family, split households. His parents were both uh, bar owners. And he would go back and forth. My dad tried military service and that wasn't for him. He met my mom had my brother, and then our Uncle Ralph preached the gospel to him, and that changed his life. Amen. He saved. I've butted heads with my father on doctrine and interpretation of passages of scripture, but I've never doubted his salvation, and I'm a skeptic. I get that from him. <laughs> I believe he's saved. I know for a fact he has the victory right now. Amen. If, he, if he could talk, he'd probably say, sorrow not. Sorrow not as others that have no hope. Yeah, amen. What do we have to be sorry about? Thank God. His promises are true. One of my earliest memories of my dad, that was about my daughter's age. We were going out soul winning running buses, bringing kids to church. I remember that. I cherish that. Naomi's my soul winning buddy today. My dad was a hard worker. If I'm not mistaken, that was probably the last thing he said to me. I wanted to come see him again and I'm, I live a busy life. I have four children, and I work a full-time secular job, and I preach four times a week. I'm, I'm blessed to have a church. And he just said, do the work. Just work, son. That's what we're here for, men. We're to honor the Lord in our work, in our time that we're here. We're to do it with purpose of heart. Glorify Him and all that He's given us the opportunity. It is the gift of God to be able to get up and go to work. I'm thankful my father opened my eyes to a lot of aspects of life that you can't learn out of a textbook. I'm, I'm thankful that we had a chance to operate a business together and he encouraged me in the areas that I was talented and he saw that I wasn't exactly like him and he didn't try to force me to be just like him, but there are certain things I can't help. I'm probably like him. <laughs> i never forget it when my dad called me and said, I met an angel. You know, if you don't believe that God is a God of second choices, chances and grace and mercy, then you don't know the story of Doug and Linda. God was merciful to my father, helped him, 
by sending an angel. And I'm thankful that she helped him to finish well. One of the things that we as men are commanded to do is to finish well, glorifying God. The elderly are to be in the church to the last of their days. You're, you're training your grandchildren to see that this is what we do. We serve God to the end of our life. We talk about God when we're in pain. We thank Him for our destination. I'm thankful for Pastor Patrick being here. and You may not know it, but your sermons have been shared with me and they've been a blessing to me. And I'm thankful for Pastor Johnson and I... As a preacher, you spend your time either reading the Bible or listening to other preaching when you're driving. That should be the best way to fill your ears, and I'm, I'm thankful for your preaching. It's a, it's a blessing. I'm thankful that my dad found this church. I imagine if we were in Pensacola, this would probably be the church we'd attend. My dad's pretty picky when it comes to churches. <laughs> You checked all, most of the boxes, I, I guess, so <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to tell you a few things that my dad gave me. My dad, he gave me life, if you will. He gave me a name. I was told last night he gave me his looks. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. He gave me my childhood, a, a, really, a really good, peaceful childhood. He certainly gave me his sense of humor. He gave me his compassionate heart. He gave me a mind for discernment. I really believe he gave me a calling to ministry as well. He gave me the sense of helping others and finding fulfillment in that. The best thing he gave me was the gospel. He gave me eternal life. And the list of the things that I've just given you that my Father gave to me, He didn't give me any of it. God the Father in heaven gave it to me. And my daddy's with Him. It breaks my heart when I realize I can't call Him. Dad, I got a tough issue, man. I need, what do you think? What's your opinion? I can't call him, but you know what? That's, I can always call my father. Right, amen. I thank God for that. God gave me all those things. God, God gave me a good dad. I want to share some thoughts from the scriptures with you. and If you would, please go to Proverbs 17. Again, I, I believe if my father were here, he would say, don't, don't preach a funeral, preach a revival. Compel us to serve the Lord with our whole life. My dad really loved your preaching. He sent me a lot of your sermons. Pardon. One of which was the, the marks of a church in a series that you were going, Pastor Johnson, and what he didn't know was I had already listened to it by the time he sent it to me. <laughs> My dad loved your preaching because he says you would alliterate things. I thought he was calling you illiterate. <laughs> Quite the contrary, if you've listened to his preaching, everything has to begin with a certain letter. And, and in that spirit, I'll follow your lead. Amen. In Proverbs chapter 17, if you'll read verse 22 with me, the Bible reads, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. One of the greatest things I received from my earthly father was a sense of humor. And I know that God has a sense of humor. Oh, does he ever. My first point is that my dad was comical. He was very comical. He knew how to make you laugh. And I'm thankful for that because humor heals. Amen. I've been in churches where the preacher was a, a prune face and never smiled and never 
talk to the children and just had a good and just I mean thank God for the things that we have and what a what a blessing it is to make your spouse laugh and your children laugh and even strangers that you don't know if you can put a smile on their day and I tell people sometimes if no one else made you smile today I want to be the first and, and I don't know if I got that from my dad or if, what but it, it I got that spirit from him Making people laugh and smile, it opens hearts and it opens doors. My dad was comical. He, if you knew him, if you spent any time with him, he probably made you laugh. And we can thank him for that. If you would go to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8. If you would... First, find verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now look at verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I want to tell you, my dad was a conqueror, and he has now conquered death through the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ. My dad was a conqueror in life, and he taught me that we should have a comeback. He taught me that you're going to get knocked down, you're going to fall, you're going to trip, you're going to have problems, you're going to get discouraged, but you should get back up. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. I thank God that he kept getting back up, that he kept fighting, that he gave me this spirit. That it, Hey, if God be for us, who, I mean, why would we ever stop and just give up? You think of the power that David had as he fought that Goliath. And he told them to, to be encouraged, to not be dismayed, and he's encouraging the hearts of others. And we need to carry that same spirit. Death is not our end. We have victory in the death of this body. We look forward to that great day. We which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord. It's coming. If you guys haven't noticed, it's getting weirder and weirder out there. <laughs> We need to move forward and fight our whole life, taking ground. I was able to preach through Genesis last year, and I was just amazed as he brought the patriarchs together, and he says, and I have a double portion for you that I took with my own sword. It just makes me think we have opportunities before us in this life. And I'm thankful for the message last night. It's not about covetousness. It's about contentment. We, we need to live for him while there's time. And we need to give a goodly, godly heritage to our children. And I, I don't want to just see my children um, grow up and stay in church. I want to see my children grow up and serve in church. Amen. If you would go to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. When you get there, please find verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, and love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Being pitiful, we misuse that word today. It means full of pity for others. He says to have compassion. The Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect example, he looked on the crowd. He looked on the brokenhearted, and he had compassion on them. He told us to heal the brokenhearted. I thank God that he gave me a father that was compassionate, and he taught me to love. My dad told me to love him while you got him. Love him while you got him. When you're with someone, love him. Build them up, encourage them, cheer them up. In Jude, it talks about of some having compassion, making a difference. Making a difference. We are called through the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us to make a difference, to have compassion. We can love the loveless. We really can. If you would go back to Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm thankful that every moment that I spent with my dad, he went out of his way to demonstrate his love. One of the men in our church 
as a student of having a successful family after watching brothers and sisters and friends and family lose their children to the world. And he brought this point to me and he said, a child's ability for love is set by the father. They all love their mama. But a child's ability to love and demonstrate compassion for other people is set by the father in how he loves them. And if dad's cold and harsh, then it will make them that way. In Hebrews 13, look at verse 5, please. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I want to talk about conversation. One of the things my father taught me is to have a good conversation. That word as we use it today is not the same as we see it in the Bible. We use, we've really dumbed down the definition of it. The conversation, in a sense, is what others say of you. The conversation is your walk and your talk. As you read through the Bible, you find many men, and Noah walked with God. That was a man God could use. Abraham talked with God. We are to walk with God everywhere we go. We're to talk with God everywhere we go. When it says pray without ceasing, that means don't stop talking to God. It's not just, you know, I'm going to throw a prayer up for mealtime so I don't get poisoned. That's not what, that's not what prayer is supposed to be. Years ago, when I lived here in Pensacola, I lived in these apartments and, and I was on the second floor and I was meditating on this thought of praying without ceasing. And I was trying to wrap my mind around it and meditate on it. And as I I was running up the stairs, as I would often just jump two or three stairs because time is short, you know. and, And I missed one and I came about this close from smashing my face. And I was praying to the Lord, oh Lord, help. I thought, ooh, I was praying without ceasing. Our conversation, oftentimes we don't pray until we're in a disaster. The end of our life, we typically don't come to God until we really, really need Him. If you're going to live a healthy life, now is the time to focus on your health, not when you've lost it. If you're going to live a godly life and have a good conversation, a walk and a talk, it's an everyday thing. You set a goal, you make a plan, you see the vision, and you stay on course, and you correct yourself, and you do everything you can so that when you get to the end of your life, you can say, I walked with God, and I talked with God. My conversation was with the Lord. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. That is the enemy of Christianity covetousness how much stuff can i gather you've seen him he who has the most toys wins those retarded uh, absolutely insane bumper stickers no you have the most toys you get the most debt we're sending some treasure on before our treasures up there our time is limited let our conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have you understand contentment and covetousness are two opposite ends of the spectrum And when I get to the end of my life, I want to be able to say I'm content with everything God has given me or not given me. I don't want to live a life full of covetousness, always wanting something that doesn't belong to me. That my Father has determined I don't need. It may destroy me. I'm thankful that my Father taught me to walk and talk with God. Not with the lost world. My dad often rebuked me for friends. Even when I was out of his house and I'm on my own and there were certain friends, he would say, son, you don't see it yet. But that guy's bad news. You need to stay away from him. Sometimes a father just has a certain level of discernment that we don't understand until we get older. And I have to tell you, Christian separation, this is not an old-fashioned concept. It's for today. I mean, it is a Baptist fundamental to be separate 
to be separate from the world, to be separate from the lost. And I know we go into the world and we preach to them and we work with them, but we shouldn't mingle with them and lose our testimony. We need to, we need to really embrace being separate so we can be closer to the Lord and walk with Him more. Amen. Finally, if you go to Proverbs 14, if you read your daily proverb and in our church, we read it every time we get together, and I encourage my people to start their day there. It's a great place to create a healthy habit of start your morning in the book of Proverbs, get up five minutes earlier and just go to Proverbs, and then you build from there, and then you add some daily Bible reading routines. In Proverbs 14, our proverb for today Look at verse 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. Here's my final point. It was comical, uh, conqueror, compassion, conversation, and then finally confidence. The things I can thank my, my dad for, I thank God for. I have confidence in my salvation because my father taught me from the Bible. He'll never leave me nor forsake thee. No man can pluck me out of his hand. Amen. And hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. God doesn't lie. He doesn't break promises. He finished the work. It's not based on my works. Look, he says in verse 26, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Look at the verse prior to that, verse 25. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. I want to compel you. Are you a true witness? Are you trying to deliver souls from the fire? Are you a soul winner? Are you preaching the gospel? Are you witnessing? Are you a true witness that can praise the Lord for the confidence that we have in His Word, in His gospel? There are many religions out there. Hey, there are many Baptists out there, many Christians that don't believe in eternal security. That they somehow feel like they could lose their salvation as if there's a certain sin that Jesus didn't die for. When I go out and preach the gospel, I'll ask people, I say, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? And I pause just enough so they can begin to answer. And then I say, or do you think you can lose your salvation? Because everybody will say, oh, I believe Jesus died for all my sins. And then they'll say, but if I go and do that or go back to this, surely I'd lose it. The gift of God is eternal life. A gift is free. Eternal is forever. It's free in forever. I have great confidence in that. I have confidence in salvation. Please go to Ecclesiastes 8. I have confidence in that. You know, and this is... That's not the last test. That is the test. You have faith in the promise of God that he sent his son to die for all of our sins and it's finished, it's paid for. That's the only test that matters in this life. That is our purpose in this life is to see that and believe it. In Ecclesiastes 8, if you would find verse number 6. Because to every purpose there is a time and judgment, Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. There's a time for everything. There's judgment coming. We're all going to have a day of misery. But there's good news in it. Look at verse 7. For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death that there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. When your day is up, when your time is up on earth and you're going to stand before the Father and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I imagine that all of us in that moment we're also going to say, but wait, I wasn't done. I can do better. Let me do more. I wasn't finished. I wanted to say one last thing. I wanted to recognize, reconcile with somebody else. There's no discharge in that war. You don't get to control your spirit. You don't get to control when your last day is. So I would encourage you to make every day as if it were your last. I know that's easy to say. But as my dad taught me, love them while you got them. Make the best of the little moments that you have. Hug their neck. Tell them God is good. 
tell them that this is the answers to all of their problems. It's right here. He's, he's written us a love letter. Amen. If you'll go to John 3 and we'll finish there. John chapter 3. First look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I don't know the date that my father was born again, but I know that he was. If you will, while you're here, look at verse 15. That whosoever, that means anybody, believeth, that means trust in, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's no hell for those that have trusted in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You know, a eulogy, to eulogize someone means to praise them and give them the glory. And again, I really believe my father would say, don't glorify me, son, I've made some mistakes. Glorify God, rather. And yet, today, he's not condemned. It was all put on the cross. It's all been forgiven here to tell you the good things that my father's given me and it all came from God I have a goodly heritage he that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil the problem is the world is dark and they love their darkness. They love their evil deeds and they'd rather embrace that than come to the light, which is Christ. He says in verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be man made manifest that they are wrought in God. Coming to Christ is stepping in the light and saying, Lord, I know I've failed you in my life and with my works, but I want to do truth. I want to come to the life. I want, I want my life to begin to resemble the Lord Jesus Christ. Last verse, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. We all know people that don't have the Son. And the wrath of God is abiding on them. And it's hard to persuade them. We're, we're called to persuade them, to compel them, to convince them. That takes work and prayer. It takes effort. It takes the Word of God and the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's not too late for some of the people you know to get them saved. It's not too late. My heart aches, but my spirit is on fire. Every, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. I thank God that now that my father has passed, he's in heaven. Amen. He beat us home. And we're going to go see him one day soon. No more hunger, no more thirsting, no more weeping, no more tears, no more sin, no more temptation, no more doubting, no more fears. In that home the Lamb shall find them, He shall lead them on their way. Where the living fount is flowing, and shall wipe all tears away. Never 
sigh or sorrow come. Alleluia, songs we raise, joy eternal, endless praise. No more longing for the morning, no more watching for the day, no more groping in the darkness, no more mist to clear the way. Morning splendors are eternal, for in heaven there is no night. All unknown are mist and shadows, for the Lamb, He is the light. Heavenly home, happy home, never sigh or sorrow come. Joy eternal, endless prayer. 